I want to briefly introduce um, our guests who we'll be talking with this evening. Um, but I, I'm going to want them to sort of give a quick description of what they do. But um, Brian Deegan is one of the foremost um, bike um, lane designers and bike system designers in the United Kingdom. Um, and he's working in um, London. He's working in Manchester. He's working in places that um, are becoming bike friendly very quickly that you may not have heard of, like Leicester. And, and Brian will say more about some of, the, some of these places, but um, it's bike strategy, it's bike lean design, it's networks. Um, and Kate and I have worked, worked together back at, at DOT during the Bloomberg administration, uh, primarily on getting city bike in the ground. Um, interestingly, we got to travel a little bit together. And so before we even met Brian, um, we rode on one of his bike lanes um, near King's Cross in, in London. And, um, and maybe we'll, we'll get into that story of that bike lane a little bit. Um, but um, Kate now works at the National Association of City Transportation Officials, which does technical assistance and policy development for cities around North America. Um, so, but Brian, that, that was a, a very fast introduction for me. Can you do like a second tweet length um, description of, of, of what you do? Sure. I mean, albeit it's one of my favourite things to talk about myself at length. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have uh, <laughs> many titles. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a kind of class all rounder. My official job title is I'm a design engineer and I work for an independent consultant called uh, Urban Movement. Well, I've held various titles at Transport for London. I worked uh, under the mayor, who's now our prime minister. And so I spend a lot of my time these days advising mayors on design and checking that everybody's uh, homework's up to snuff. So uh, I write a lot of national and regional guidance and make sure that people find it. So I used to design and deliver schemes. But now I check everybody else's, which is not nearly as much fun, but keeps me busy. That's me. All right, Kate. Oh, look. <laughs> Kate, um, Kate, can you do the same? What's the what's the tweet length version of your? Uh, and you seem to be muted. You, Kate, I don't know, Kate. You still seem to be muted. Are we muting Kate on our end? Uh. Let me I I I asked her to. She oh, should unmute. Yeah. Okay. There okay. We are. There we are. Thank you. Sorry, we have a no, it's okay. small um, guest behind me. Um, hi, I'm Kate Thornier. I'm the Strategy ne Director at NACTO, so National Association of City Transportation Officials. Um, and as John said, we, we advise cities across North America. There are about you. There are about 86 of them, uh, the US and Canada, and really help connect them together to trade best practices. We really started in bike lane design and helping a small subset of cities write the, the sort of first guidebook for how you would do protected bike lanes that have gone from there into transit lane design, contextual guidance, um, and a whole variety of other topics around um, how you make city streets work better for people biking and walking and taking transit. Hi. Hang on a second. <laughs> Great. Um, so look, one of the, one of the reasons we, um, we wanted to get these guys on is because they, they see and watch and review and have input on a variety of um, variety of uh, cities. And in New York, one of the one of the big challenges we have is not so much getting a bike lane out the door and onto the street. It's what happens once the bike lane is there. Um, we have, you know, an almost completely lawless situation on the streets where any flat surface is, is, you know, open season for cars and trucks. And, you know, there are a variety of reasons the city sites for why it doesn't sort of better isolate the bike space far from, you know, the traffic and the parking. Um, and I want to talk about some of those specifically, but just to sort of set the problem, you know, we have a bike network that's basically full of cars and trucks. And it makes it very, very hard to use, even if you're an experienced rider, let alone somebody who wants to um, go with their uh, their daughter, like Kate, or um, you know anybody who's not like a super confident, um, you know, vehicular type, throw elbows with cabs cyclists. So let me just ask you guys, like, I mean, Kate, you live in New York, and Brian, I've described this to you a bunch of times. 
Um, and, and in fact, let me just do this for a second. Like, this is kind of where we're at. Um, like, these pictures are not hard to obtain. In fact, I have like thousands of pictures like this. And because it's ubiquitous and every time you go out, you see it. And every time you go out, like, you have to like stop yourself from taking photos because you have to get somewhere. But you could take, you know, a million more of those photos. And in some ways, this is kind of our poster child. Um, you know, in general, we, we call this, the city calls this a protected bike lane. Um, but as you can see, the protection has been killed and left the dead for dead in the street. And um, the van is there and the van is also next to it. So where do you go as a, as a um, as a cyclist. So really my question um, for you guys is, is this, is this just New York dysfunction or is this everywhere in the world or in North America? Um, and you know, just, just sort of have at it. What are, what are you guys seeing around the, around the, around the city? Do you want to go first? It doesn't matter, just dive in. It's, it's definitely not a, a New York only problem. <laughs> Anywhere that's not completely cordoned off with bollards, uh, someone will park on it. But it's, it's interesting in the UK at the moment, London always had special powers to enforce them, you know, and it does enforce them. And, and the mayor's in charge of the police force and it's the priority. So it was taken quite seriously. In the rest of the UK, it wasn't. And it was up to the police to enforce it, but they weren't going to. So, uh, you know, really, we've just passed some legislation so local authorities can can start issuing fines and doing something about it when cars are blocking bike lanes, which is a, a real game changer because uh, uh, at the moment it's kind of a moving traffic offence that we call it. So it's, uh, you know, you can't be done for parking in it we don't for driving in it and the police have to spot you so we couldn't even find people outside of london so we're we're making big efforts but yeah i could show you uh, um block cycle lanes all across the uk you know what if you go to to denmark and holland you're going to find block cycle lanes as well and it's all a question of how seriously the city takes it and how you speak you know how you used to the to the cycle lanes the drivers get really and, and know what they're asking for. Well, when I'm putting one in that one that you rode around, John, that you introduced, I spoke to every single um, um, vehicle owner and every single household and every single business and said, this is coming in. If you're parking it, I'm coming at you with everything I've got. And it took that to keep people out of it. So uh, that's, that's the UK experience as well, I'm afraid, but we're, we are taking it seriously. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. People are people pretty much everywhere you go. Um, I suspect the intensity of the problem may ramp up some in New York, um, partially just because of the, the sheer size of territory we have that is super high density um, versus other cities that have a much more discrete sort of specific downtown. Um, and also because there's a whole host of policy solutions that you know it sounds like Brian was sort of alluding to that New York doesn't avail of it avail itself of to actually deal with the problem. Um, and then a host of other design pieces as well, you know, places where you've got a more defined downtown core, you can, the, um, the sort of physical protections of the lane can be more extreme, which is what you need in places where you've got a lot of cars, you know, or a lot of parking activity, or if you had high speeds, which, you know, isn't really a New York problem in the same way, but the volume and parking activity definitely is. So Brian, you said, um, you know, if it's not completely walled off by bollards or, or, you know, walls or whatever, it's going to have some cars and trucks in it. Is there, is, are you starting to work, are you guys working in Manchester, London, et cetera, on designs that prevent that physically? Or do you have to rely on enforcement at the end of the day? Well, there's a couple of things that just the design engineering process that I recommend is to always do like um, a freight study of the area what are the freight needs what's coming in there what kind of vans where did they drop off and unless you go through that properly like i'll give you an example in the uk if there was like a flower shop you might go oh that's nice and just walk past it this will be a lovely place to do a bike lane but to an engineer like myself that'd be all the alarm bells going off so now it's a double articulated lorry coming from uh, from holland <laughs> where all the tulips are and I've got to somehow accommodate that on the street so I think to an extent you've got to think about the freight and the management of it and when I worked at TFL I worked next to the bus people and transit and also the freight one and I always consider freight first and foremost I'm a 
chartered member of the Institute of Logistics and Transport, and it's it's absolutely key to get it right. So I'd say what's going wrong with freight and curbside loading activity, that's your big issue. And the fact that we've got all these cars to park somewhere until we start reducing them to tackle the climate emergency, those big policy drivers. But first and foremost, what's happening with freight? How are you managing it? Could they all be consolidated and just have two or three vans? I know when we looked at Oxford Street in London, there was like a, a local group there that got together and, and actually consolidated all the freight and said, why is every, every individual shop bringing a truck in? They all did it. And there was like a 60 to 70% drop in the amount of HTV traffic going down there. So I think you need um, a, freight, a freight plan and every area does it, and it's not glamorous, and you want to go to the cycle lanes, but that space will just be blocked unless you think first and foremost about the parking arrangements and the freight needs of the businesses. Um, Brian, Brian do you, does the, is the UK uh, sort of experiencing this, you know, Amazon online, you know, truck to every door kind of phenomenon that's just causing trucks to multiply like rabbits on your streets? Yeah, it's a massive problem. So cheers for that, Bezos. <laughs> um, but... Um, <laughs> we all like the uh, the comfort of it, but we've we've had like over the past ten years, um, cars on our our quiet residential roads that we've doubled the amount of traffic going on there, and we're all thinking about what do we do about this, and and that's why we've been pushing the kind of low traffic neighbourhoods approach to to try and tackle it because it's got worse and worse with uh, everybody, particularly during the emergency, everybody's getting everything delivered to their house, so we've got freight issues everywhere now rather than just on the main roads like we had it before. Um, so yeah, cert certain um, cities put in solid bollards and go, well, that's it. That's the only way we protect that space. But it can make it look quite a prison like if you've got solid bollards everywhere. And you like to think there's like a more reasonable way of, uh, of dealing with this. Um, and like say in London, it's, it's, it's not as bad. We still get the odd issue, but it's, it's an absolute nightmare. But pavement parkings are a huge problem across the UK, which we've just had like a, a whole governmental um, strategy paper done, like how we're going to tackle this one. Places like Scotland and Wales are trying to ban it. But at the moment, all our pavement, you can't even walk down the street, let alone ride down a bike lane. So we've got fundamental issues with parking and loaded in the UK and uh, we're, we're trying to get there. But our, our only real solution at the moment is a bollard. Yeah, I mean, one, one, of, the, one of the fights in New York, and it's it's still very nascent because the city's only sort of moved about a millimeter into it is, you know, trying to define loading zones on every block so that the, you know, like even if you have a bike lane that's not physically separated, if the truck stops in the travel lane, then all the rest of the traffic ends up in the bike lane. Um, so if we have places for trucks to go, I would like to see more of a metered so there was like a, you know, a turnover kind of thing and, and just, you know, maybe more, more metering of, parking generally, so we're not, you know, having just so much uh, entitlements around it. Um, but, you know, you're looking at those kinds of things. And, and one of the things I'm always amazed at in New York is, you know, time of day restrictions on deliveries are never discussed and get shouted down incredibly quickly if it comes up. But I don't see how we do, you know, pedestrian streets and um, really make it work without time of day restrictions like you would have in Paris or, you know, even in Brazil, they do it just because the gridlock is so extreme. Um, but we have road capacity. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just in the middle of the night. Yeah, just. To I go mean, down. I think it's sort of a threefold. Sorry. Go ahead, Kate. I was going to say it's, it's sort of a threefold problem. The first is design, you know, and, and that's that's honestly the simplest part of it. In places where you've got a lot of cars or a lot of parking activity or again a lot of speed, you have to protect the bike lane more robustly. You know, the easiest, the cheapest thing, I think, for the level of traffic we're talking about is probably just the sort of extruded cast in place concrete. You know, there are people who are doing it all over the place. Atlanta's doing it. I mean, the Lord, uh, Atlanta, Toronto, Seattle, obviously, that's the background picture. Um, you know, and in a lot of places, they're honestly finding that it's as cheap as the thermo that they would use for the marking. You know, you can, you can do this stuff fast and you just have to sort of commit to when you're dealing with places that have a lot of cars moving or a lot of people parking, you have to protect it. It brings up a whole other set of conversations about um, street sweeping. We will get there. Um, but so then you have to, once you've got that, you have to figure out the sort of network solutions that can support that. You know, so that's the places where there isn't enough basically space in the road to build a good lane that's protected it the way you need it to based on the way traffic is currently moving. So that's things like 
taking Central Park West from two lane, from two directions to one direction because A, it would be safer and B, you would build back a whole bunch of capacity. But then the thing that is, and this is sort of where we're going, is all the policy solutions that underscore it. And I think Brian's completely right that the freight policy is probably the most important one that you have to start with um, in terms of just why there's this much stuff happening in the in the street and why there's this much parking in the bike lane is because we are all ordering boatloads of things online and expecting it to be there tomorrow or the next day or you know the same day and people are are bringing it to us in trucks and the reality is is most of those trucks are actually nowhere near full you know, but we've all gotten ourselves to a world where we're expecting that delivery to show up. So then you need to start thinking through what are the policy solutions that can do exactly what John's saying, you know, hey, let me stop things, you're things you're at the many, time of day, et cetera. You're saying many things. So let's let's focus on many things quickly. Sorry. Incidentally, the, the EPS guys on my block come uh, by on foot um, but with hand trucks and, and like little carts, but but it's from the truck that's parked in the bike lane um, two blocks down. Um, you know, so it's still it's still it's still an issue, um, and we do need to sort that out. But but you know, you mentioned Kate, like you have this curb separated lane in Seattle behind you, um, and in New York, one of the most maddening things is you know the lanes that we set aside with um, with parking parked cars, where we moved the parked cars off the curb, started you know with Jeanette as commissioner in 2007. Those really work pretty well in New York. I mean, not nothing's perfect, but in the main, they work. Um, but but we have we have no other solution in New York that works except Jersey barriers, and those tend to be around highways and things like that, like you know Williamsburg Street by the Navy Yard, or you know over by um, the Waterside Development on the East Side where there's all these FDR ramps, um, and we need we need something else. So like what you know I mean it's it's amazing that you say Atlanta is sort of doing better to find bike lanes than us. And Brian, you know please ch jump in. Let's talk just about bike lane design for now, because you know, the freight is like, yes, we need to do that. We need to find places for all the things on our streets, but um, seems like we're behind on bike lane design period in, in New York. And you know, I wanted to understand why. So who else, so what, I mean, who else are you seeing Kate in North America that's doing it well? Like, I mean, I we did a little bit of business in Montreal back in, 2013, and even then they had stuff that looked even more robust than what you have behind you. Um, and they have a mayor now who's really going gangbusters on it. It's probably the, you know, she's like the Anne Hidalgo of North America. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the North American cities are starting to, to dig in on this more robust design. Um, you know, the, again, the extruded concrete is pretty cheap in the grand scheme of things. Um, so, so wait, um, explain extruded concrete. Um, what, what is that? <laughs> Like, how is that thing behind you installed? Um, it basically just means cast in place. So just like put down pieces. pieces of- They bring in those pieces Put of down some wood. Yeah. Um, or you can just um, basically put down, I mean, it, you've seen it in, in some places, but essentially just put down some wood, pour some concrete, call it a day. Um, and we're seeing oh, it in, in places like Austin. Awesome. You're not prefabricated. You can do it either way. Um, I think the, the prefab is often a little bit more expensive, but um, it sort of depends on, on your city and, and your materials. Um, and often they figured out a way to basically just sort of literally cast it in place and that's gone pretty well and pretty cheaply. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not a technical challenge. This stuff is pretty easily doable and largely pretty cheap to do. Um, a bunch of the cities have been going to sort of a heavier bollard solution. So instead of the like super flexible Davidson bollards, they're going to, I think they're called like K79, I don't know exactly the number, number. Um, but so San Jose, for example, is doing essentially a bollard that just looks sturdier. It's kind of the scratch your paint theory of mm -hmm. bike lane protection. Not Drivers right. don't want to do stuff that's going to mess up their paint. Okay. Um, you know, it's not protection, but it's enough to make you think twice. Um, and then there's also some other stuff. So like the folks in, in Houston um, are using those little armadillo thing they're i don't they they're sort of like a little they're roundish a pump. yeah i think we had some of those yeah, in, but in royal college street we were talking about the brian design yeah it's, it's the world of you know all the bike lane design elements that are named after animals but so one's called armadillos just imagine an armadillo um and make them a little longer 
Uh, but they're using them specifically in places where there's a lot of loading. So places where you have to break the bike lane, like break the heavier protection on the bike lane because there's a curb cut into a loading dock. So they'll use the armadillos there. The average driver doesn't want to go over them because they're bumpy, um, but it's completely easy for a truck that actually has to get in there to go. Um, so there's a whole variety of stuff out there. Um, and cities all over North America are are trying this stuff. It's just it's just a matter of um, getting it into the lexicon. Brian, how about how about in your experience? What kind of have we muted you from our end? Come on, let's keep let's keep everyone's mic on. If you mute yourself, then you can't unmute. Oh, all right. Ah, I'm back. Oh, but yeah, I was hugging the, the space. I think uh, <laughs> we got time now. Uh, but yeah, like uh, the armadillo, it's good to, because uh, I was one of the people that named them armadillo. So it's great that that, that name came out there. Uh, yeah. I imported a truck from, from Barcelona and they were calling them uh, zebras over there. Uh, but we were, well, we've already got a zebra. We're going to have to come up with something um, silly. So the, the armadillo name <laughs> came around there. But yeah, definitely like in, in the UK, we're, like a, particularly during like a, the COVID crisis when everybody, it was like a, um, a process that really met its time. Everybody started doing pop-up cyclones and the government was putting millions saying, everybody give these a go. Uh, there was a bit of a run on materials and you know people were struggling to get the right stuff. So we've got so many different things now that do. We've got like our orcas, which are like a more solid rubber one. Because the, the thing about the, the PVC armadillo is just to get, this might be too much engineering detail, but until John tells me to stop, I'll keep going. They're a recycled like electrical wires. So they kind of shatter if anything really large hits it. And then we've got the kind of rubber ones, but you can shear a bit off of that. Right through to what we're looking at at the moment, which a lot of people are doing. We've got like a, a fake curve that you can put epoxy resin on and just stick it in and then load up if you want that kind of Danish effect with asphalt on the, on the inside. Um, to like shallow bedded ones, to like bolt down curves that look exactly the same. Uh, we've got a whole range of stuff now. I was going to show uh, show this. Uh, I'm, I'm not the salesman for it, but we've got like a whole suppliers directory of different stuff we can use for, for active travel and uh, been helping developing some of those different products. So there's there's all sorts of stuff and the, um, they pretty much look like the real thing. And so we have the same issue in the UK, unless we put a solid curb there and, and we know that if, we know there's some kind of freight issues. People are going to drive over it, and but and I will say one of one of the examples we used on the on the east, west, and north, south superhighway in London, where we knew this might happen and vehicles might get on there, just to build it really wide and curb segregated. And what we get is like the emergency services use the cycle tracks to get across the city quicker, and there's still space to pull over and let an ambulance go past you in it. So. So there's working with it as well. Never forget, you just build it really wide and take out a lane and a half, then you've got that resilience in the city as well. So there's there's lots of different techniques you can do now, and they all look really solid. Um, yeah, and, and bollards to get into that. We've got as long as the passive safety's there and you kind of bend or break up, you get ones that look really effective, but are re really solid now because the the old ones the I think you were calling candles for a while in America, but they get a little bit drunk and a little bit of a cue that you can just drive over them. And the, pardon my graphic expressions there. But no, that's uh, right. I mean, look, that's, we, you know, better. One, one snowstorm and like 50% of those things are destroyed in, in New York, um, which happened just a month ago. So Brian, it's cool that you mentioned all, you know, this sort of wide range of things that are available. Cause you know, one of the things that was driving us crazy in the spring was, the European pop-up lanes look better than our permanent lanes in, in a lot of cases. Um, and so, you know, we just, we have to get much more robust. Let me ask you and Kate and, and Brian, you can both weigh in on whether you think there's a particular institutional problem in New York where we have two separate departments and one, and this was created in the 1990s, the, the city DOT used to do the hard rebuild of streets as well as the traffic engineering and the, you know, the regulatory stuff. But now we have city DOT, which works only in those mediums of paint, plastic, traffic signals and regulations. And we have a separate department of design and construction, which does the hard rebuild of streets. And 
they don't do a whole lot of streets and, and we, I don't wanna go down a, a wormhole about the Department of Design and Construction, but do you think the fact that there's this sort of Berlin wall between the two practices is one reason we're not, we're, we're not getting sort of more robust sort of intermediate stuff like the concrete things Kate was talking about or the, you know, the like at least dent your fender kind of um, big plastic things that we could be using, um, you know, because I mean, and Kate, you know this better than I, but like you you have a picture of Seattle. Seattle DOT has a, like a project development office that spins off both types of projects. And I think Chicago does as well. And maybe San Francisco also doesn't have that hard and fast um, line between what's a capital project and what's considered like a quick build operating project. So is it, you know, do we need some real institutional change in New York to find that middle ground that just seems to be missing completely? I'll, I'll just say from the, oh, sorry, go on, Kate. I'm always jumping in on you. No, go ahead. So go, go. We have the exact same institutional problem. <laughs> yeah, well, lots of things were joined together on in the, in the UK. Same issue that you get the kind of maintenance team and then you get the design team. And the design team sp spends ages and go backwards and forwards. And eventually it has to go to someone real who actually digs up the road and they go, well, why would you want to do any of that nonsense? We do it like this. It's the, the exact same issue. And some areas have got better at it than others. Like in, in London, it's quite good now. You'll, you'll plan, you can see that maintenance is going to happen. It's a really good time to spend big and, and to rechange your roads. And uh, I'll mention Leicester as well, where the pop-up lanes that have been done as part of the emergency have been done by the maintenance teams but it's still we, we have a slightly bigger problem than you across the rest of the uk is that all we've got is maintenance teams for most of the uk people don't even design anymore it's all about just trying to like fill those holes and resurface when it's like a election time and nobody's <laughs> even really doing street design so getting people to actually consider a change I live in a kind of rural area just outside London. There's not been a street design change here for 30 years. And that's the issue that we have in there. So you've got those two teams. That's good. <laughs> Getting them to work together is definitely would make it better. But at least you've got people designing and thinking about change. So uh, I'm always overly positive. But that is something you, you've got over us. Get, get them to work for sure. Sorry, Kate, I'll let you. Well, I, again, I think we have, we have high capacity places and low capacity places like like anybody, but um, you know, we're talking about the biggest cities right now. And we're talking about New York. Yeah, I mean should be able to get this done. I mean cities are cities are building stuff in a whole variety of different sort of structures of their DOT from like completely, you know, everything in one and the public works of, you know, the big soup down to, you know, completely lots and lots of separate different agencies. Um, my instinct is to say is that in strong mayor systems, which is what New York has, um, the more cohesive it is, the better. Um, it, there are ways to do it um, across multiple agencies, but it just takes a lot more coordination and leadership from the top. So it involves, you know, reporting up to the same deputy mayor who's actually bringing both agencies together and forcing them into the room. It involves a whole host of uh, project level coordination that's not just like two people who are willing to talk to each other, but actually ingrained into the way those projects get developed in those agencies. So um, the split structure probably doesn't help. There are workarounds, but one of the workarounds, you know, fundamentally could be thinking through how to, how to force the structure that makes those agencies coordinate better or actually an and actual what, combination. You know, and one of the consequences is not just um, of, of having sort of a, a very paint oriented group and then a very slow moving construction oriented group is we basically do very almost no physical traffic calming in New York. We, there's so much paint and plastic that there's nothing that you're afraid to run into as a driver other than like the buildings and the people and the parked cars. Um, you know, whereas traffic calming really is about forcing drivers to slow down because there's a metal thing or a stone thing and we're just not getting the metal and stone. Um, we're really rebuilding hardly any streets and um, you know, even the streets that have protected bike lanes on them that get rebuilt, just get repainted the way they are right now. So, I mean, we absolutely do not have that kind of coordination. It's something, you know, we're going to be talking to the candidates about for 20, you know, for the election this year is, you know, DOT alone isn't going to make a bike friendly in New York. We have to have a lot of other institutions chipping in. And I want to get to a few more of those issues in a minute, but um, 
But since we're talking about, you know, the teams and the ability to, um, you know, to actually put physical stuff in the street, Brian, it, it strikes me a lot. Um, you know, when you look at the Thames embankment and that may have been slower because it was, or maybe it was faster because it was the first one, I don't know. You look at some of the successor bike lanes like the North South one that goes, you know, up that sort of central East part of London, I forget the street, but they're putting curbs in the ground um, and they're getting the curb in the ground pretty quickly. Like it seems to me like it's three or four years from starting to talk about it to finishing at least parts of it. And in New York, that kind of stuff, like I worked on something called the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway Action Plan. And some of those projects, which were handed off to the, the Department of Design and Construction in 2012, still aren't even started. And some of them are just like, like Flushing Avenue. It was just like an unbelievable, it's like one of those, you know, there's a bunch of spots in New York where you're not quite sure what the construction project is, but it's been there for like 15 years. And it's just a fact of life that there's like, cones and dirt piles and stuff all over the place. Houston and First used to be like that for like 20 years. There's one at Ninth Avenue and, and 15th right now in front of New York One. That's like that no one even knows what the project is. It's just like this permanent feature. Um, so like, how are you guys getting these like street rebuilds done in such a short time? And it strikes me also, I've been, to, I've been fortunate enough to have been in Paris three times between 2013 and 2018. And the amount of stuff just appearing on the street in, in each of those, you know, two year intervals was unbelievable. And it's big curbs in the middle of streets that are really redefining the, the space there in the, in the center of the city. Well, yeah, just to come in on that, like when we did the North, South and East, West one, the mission then was to do something that somebody liked. That was the <laughs> state we were at. Everything we'd built for cycling infrastructure wise anyway before, um, well, there was an area in London where there was a barrister leading the campaigners who used to take us to court every year for wasting public funds. So we had to get something that people liked. And then once you had that, you go, people could go, right, can I have more of that? <laughs> And that's really like a simply put, you put something in that's great and people go, that works. Let's have more of it. So we showed that something would work. We show that it didn't kill the city. We show that lot, thousands of cyclists would use it. Like a, it, there's like a 20, 15, 16,000 cyclists a day on some of those routes that we put in. Really popular, lasted there, keeping good. And so when the emergency well, came- I feel like that they're excellent, but like, how are you doing it so quickly? Oh yeah, that's what I'm getting to, honestly. <laughs> I'm getting there. It was a long wind up. Um, but yeah, so when the emergency happened, like uh, in London, 50 miles of segregated high quality route has gone in in the past nine months. And it's like, because we know what people want. We know that it works. We can put the business case together. We've seen the success. So we're just like, fill it all out, do it like that, get the orders in. We know how to construct it, bang it in. So I, I think to an extent, if, you, if you've got a plan and London had like a strategic cycle network plan and it was signed off at a high level, then when the, uh, when the momentum comes from government with some funding, you can just crack on and do it. So where's your plan <laughs> and what do you like? <laughs> what works? So the, the stage I'm sensing you're at, like, uh, and I know there are some good cycle routes in there, but like you've got problems with what you've done. So it's very hard to roll out. And your maintenance teams will be going, well, that's a nightmare. It's just blocked and we got the damage. We've got to redo these plastic things every now and again. You've got to find a template that works for you in your street context. Go look at that, more of that. And that's yeah. the kind of hump that we got over in London. And that's why it's quick. Because then when the mayor and the prime minister are saying, you've got to do it now, we're in an emergency, just get cracking on. We can send all the teams out, every crew we had in London to just build, build, build. And that's what we're trying to do. So, so that's so you've got to find a template that works. It sounds a lot. It sounds a lot like Kate's scenario where somebody at City Hall is cracking heads and saying, "I want that," and it's got to yeah, be good. What do you want, campaigners? Yeah. I'm being the engineer now, but what is the one that you want? If you pointed to like one part of New York and go, "All right, our busy roads. All right, it should be like that." I mean, look, some of some of them we do want, and that's the ones, the parking protected ones, that work pretty well. But since we have no template, other template that works, we're we're pointing at the embankment and we're pointing at you know Paris. That's well, why I asked how you're able to do it so quickly. Yeah, so you've got to not support the ones that aren't working and say actually they need to. No, be we do. We hate that. I mean, I, I'm I'll, I'll declare on you know on international Zoom that I hate plastic sticks and, and I wish we weren't using them. And it would be great if NACTA would say plastic sticks are a failed experiment. Take them out of your city. 
<laughs> well, it's certainly working in an emergency situation when you've got to roll stuff out quickly. I mean, we've got a load of stuff done in across the UK with just cones. It was like, get the teams out, cordon off some space. And, we'll, and what we're doing at the moment is cementing them all in with full curbs. But we needed to get stuff out quick. And so there's, there's a time and a place for it. But like, yeah, you have models that work. And it's a question of like, this is the New York style. Do that on this type of road. Here's how we do residential streets. And, and then people can roll it out. Um, when I worked as an engineer in Camden, I had two or three crews that, that I knew were always assigned to my jobs. So I kept them fed with work. If you do a big scheme and it's great and all the rest of it, but you, you take years to put it together and then one crew does it. And then when's the next one come along, everybody gets used to going back to business as usual. And that's what we've got to change. And, and, and that's been the big mission that I've taken around the rest of the UK. So there is no more business as usual schemes. We're not doing the bypasses to avoid the town centre. It's all cycling and walking infrastructure now. This is how we do it. Here's the templates. Crack on. Sounds easy when I say it that fast, but that's. Uh, that's oh, I love that. I love that. So let me let me. I mean, shift. I think the challenge. Sorry, go ahead. I think that, quick, John. The challenge that New York has got is that there's a break in the pipeline. Like the 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 vision is supposed to be that you do this stuff in paint and you do this stuff in like highly tactical materials so you can see if it works, not in a like pilot way, but just like. Literally, like, did we get the lines on the right place for this street? Because we, you know, forgot that there was, you know, a flower shop or whatever the American girl girl saw or, or whatever it is that has some strange set of needs. And you do it in that highly tactical material, but then you've got an immediate follow through coming as soon as you've got, like, you know, your year's worth of data to make sure it works to follow it up in increasingly hard materials until you get to that full build out. And for some reason, the way New York is structured, there's a break between that and things aren't being followed through with the with the actual, the, the more permanent material. We haven't figured out that piece of the, no, of the delivery mean, chain. The is like the Grand Canyon right now. I mean, I can't think of a single project other than the Times Square pedestrian plaza where that actually happened. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that's the point. I mean, Pike Allen was that sort of odd moment where it was like, you'd like go block by block, you know, this is many years ago, where it's like one block would be paint and the next block would be you know, finally built out and then the next block will be paint. But it was an interesting... It hasn't been touched in the de Blasio administration. No, I know. That's, but that's what I'm saying. Like, that's the place that's broken in the pipeline. And that's yeah. the place where you need leadership coming down to, to figure out how to make that more streamlined and to happen faster. Yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, I don't think we even have that. I don't think it's even recognized in government that that's the thing that you would do in New York. But what, one of the things that the models we use, because you've you got me on pipelines is that there's three things that need to be in place to, to deliver stuff effectively this i do this speech a lot i just like to give you need the political will you need the technical know-how you need the people to actually want it and if any of those three are out of line you're not going to be able to spend it and you're not going to deliver and and from what i'm hearing about new york a little bit wobbly at the top people want it and technically I kind of think you know what you're doing. There might be a few issues, or maybe there's a little bit of work on there. And, and the way I do this across like the UK is if uh, let's take uh, Greater Manchester, work with uh, uh, Chris Boardman, who's like a, a, the Cycling and Walking Commissioner there, like pretty big and famous. If it goes wrong at the top, Chris is turning up <laughs> to see the councils. If it goes wrong in the middle, I do lots of training with the technical staff. And if it goes wrong at the bottom, that it's marketing. So like I go around everywhere we work and I go, well, how's it working? Which one do we need to focus on? And, and it really helps you go out of that kind of starter city to, to use the EU's terminology to more like a climber one. So uh, it, it might be worth that analysis. That's my initial from, from looking at people's faces and the, and the way the conversation's going. Seems like you need a little bit of work at the top for them to actually buy into the plan. Technically, yeah. just- we need, we need a revolution at the top. <laughs> and, and I also say, uh, just another three things, it's always like uh, three things with me, but there's three things you need in place before you even consider cycling. And that's like a, a decent traffic management plan. So you've got the right amount of cars going down the right streets. You need 20 miles an hour, slow speeds, um, and you need control parking. I'll say it again, and I started off with it for it. Like control parking zones were the game changers in the UK when people had to pay to park in that space and, and you get your residential permit. So we knew who was going to be there and we had their details and we were paying for it. And we could start increasing that and that helped generate funds to actually change the streets around them. So, uh, you know, there's no point doing a cycle lane without those three things in place. Uh, so that's two sets that I'd like New York to think about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. Let me let me shift slightly because 
Brian, you mentioned a place where you would put in a, a lane that was so wide that it became like the de facto fire lane for a part of London. And they you know, probably increased emergency response or reduced emergency response times um, and made that better. Um, one of the issues we face in New York is, so say, there, and, and to the DOT's credit, it has put in some of those big fat plastic bollards in a few places, especially places with you know, real chronic problems or potentially chronic problems. So one of the best working bike lanes in the city right now is 8th Avenue near the Port Authority because they put in those huge bollards just like in the fall of 2019. And the lane is not quite wide enough to put a truck in, so no one drives up it. So the protection is good and the cars aren't trying to drive in it or the trucks. And the reason they're doing that is because the Port Authority bus terminal staff sweep it. They don't have to make it as big as an 11 foot street sweeper. So it only works there for a couple blocks because of the special situation. So on Grand Street in Williamsburg, there's a great protected bike lane, big and wide and goes through. And they put, and it was always blocked with trucks and cars from day one. So they put in the bigger bollards. And so now the trucks just go up inside the bollards and park in it again. Um, and, you know, so it's a disaster. So like now you're inside the lane and you can't get out because of the big fat bollards and the truck in front of you. Um, and DOT says we have to make, we have to have 11 foot clear because the sanitation department requires it for street sweepers and snow plows because they got these monster truck size sweepers and snow plows. And, you know, NACTO's put out papers about this and we see like Boston and Denver and anybody else you can think of, like they started building protective bike lanes and they brought skinny sweet street sweepers. You know, on the west side of Manhattan, we had the terrorist mow down with a car in late 2018. And so we put a massive, you know, concrete and steel bollards and the Hudson River Park Trust went and bought these like really skinny street sweepers right away. And now they sweep the, they can go through the bollard stretch, which is four feet, I measured it, um, without any problem. So, you know, I think we're getting there in this issue. We have council members fighting for them. We have, you know, sanitation people starting to talk about them, but um, like, what the heck, are, you know, you know, again, it's probably just a thing like someone at the top has to say, you guys all have to play well together I and mean, we shouldn't be, you know, designing our bike lanes for, you know, for 12, 11 foot wide street sweepers, we should be designing them for bikes. Um, but, you know, what are you, what's going on in, in the UK with that stuff, Brian? Yeah, well, city operations come around to this, the street design or, or is it yeah, still- Yeah, basically got the skinnier street sweepers, but it, again, it all comes down from that political will and, and, and I will say when we transition from um, in, in London from Boris Johnson to Sadiq Khan, there's always like a gasp of breath, like a will the mayor own these cycle lanes or will he go, that's all rubbish, I'm going to do it all properly now. And uh, one of the great things about Sadiq Khan was he just transitioned over going, actually, that was really good. We're going to do more. And we're going to do 10 times more than he did. And it's that sense of ownership. And I think if, you're, if your mayor owns the plan, that they want to see it work. Remember when we when we launched our bike higher and people were riding around on the on the Bixie bikes from Montreal and we had them over. I mean, the police were being so nice to the cyclists. It was like, oh man, you've got to ride one of those because the mayor controlled the police. He was telling everybody to watch out and keep these people safe because it was the mayor's priority. So again, I think it does come down from that leadership. If the mayor felt ownership of these bike lanes, every time one was blocked and he got a picture, he's like, this is making me look bad. This is my like a uh, top policy. If it's not, then who cares? That's just something I've dragged on from a previous administration. Yeah. So it's like continuity across across leaders is a real big one. When when Boris first came in, he scrapped all borough cycling and like uh, we lost the London Cycle Network project. It wasn't until his second term where we're all going, there's nothing happening, there's nothing happening. As he was like, just ride wherever you want. But like people finally got to him and said, no, we need to build stuff. And then he started doing the great stuff. And Sadiq, as I say, carried it on. But it could, it could have gone sideways. You're always in four year cycles, what's gonna happen? And I know you've got one coming up, but you've got to get the ownership from the leaders or you know, silly situations like that happen. Now make it their priority. Hey, Kate, can you tell the story? I think the interesting. Could you tell the story about oh, the San Francisco fire department and the bike street designers and how that got resolved? Yeah, they. Well, let me let me get there in a second. I was going to say I think the the sort of interesting thing about the sanitation conversation in in New York is that the way we currently plow streets fails more than cyclists. 
you know, everybody's got the experience of trying to hop over the giant snowdrift at the intersection when they're walking. And so it seems like there's a, you know, an interesting, you know, and it clearly it just comes back down to leadership, which is sort of where a lot of this is coming back to. But there's, there's a conversation there to, to, to think about sort of other people who could really be benefited by a holistic rethinking of the way we deal with plowing and what that looks like in New York that would, you know, clearly benefit cycling um, and potentially get a, get some of the, the smaller sweepers, but also to sort of overall make it easier for people to move around and, you know, for example, in snowstorms. So there, there's some options and, and opportunities around. Um, to, to San Francisco, and, and the story is actually a little fuzzy in my head right now, um, but, you know, they, they, they kept trying to figure out how to um, get the, the, the fire department to, to recognize that a smaller truck would work and finally, um, finally was the got fire, the, was the fire department objecting to bike lanes? Yeah, for, for the similar, sort of similar grounds um, that, uh, you know, needed more space, et cetera, too small, the street would be too small if, if the lane was there. Um, ended up taking a, the fire department actually ended up take, going out and taking a video uh, to um, prove that it was too small and in the process of taking the video proof that it actually worked just fine. Um, and then subsequently, um, the fire department did started doing some really smart thinking and ended up getting a, a smaller pumper truck um, that what they realized had actually more capacity or equal capacity to some of the other vehicles that they were using um, and was really able to, to handle all of those all the turns and all the all the new configuration with, with the lane, and it's something that we've been seeing in a bunch of different places. That you know, there there you know UK and and Europe and and have a variety of these, but there's a lot of smaller vehicles out there with higher capacity, smaller fire truck vehicles out there with equal or high capacity to what we have in the US. Um, you know that that can make those turns so much better. Do you have any nightmare stories, Brian, from emergency services sort of fighting? Fighting well, the it's interesting. People, people assume they are, they are, but they're actually quite supportive of the stuff we're doing for cycling, and particularly the low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, I mean, it, the anti groups and the, they're really quite well established in the UK now. Are all saying, "Oh, well, what if there's a fire?" What? But then the emergency service and the police are saying, "Actually, crime drops. We can get there quicker. Our times have improved." So all the evidence is actually supporting the approaches that were taken. And like I say, when the ambulances use the east-west route, which is right across the whole of central London, they're getting mm -hmm. there in no time. And it's really just put up a bit. That's somebody's life. Great, get in there. But we know it's slightly more congested on the main road as a result of it. So yeah, you're going to give up. So we haven't got that many nightmare stories. Just uh, London is congested in general. And actually, whenever we do uh, measures to, to get people out of cars and to make it more... Uh, safer to walk and cycle that normally has a net benefit on the on the on the network itself so we're, we've not had too many big issues but it is one of those things that people think is a big issue <laughs> you know, it does stop a lot of things happening but when we actually do them the issue is not manifested itself anywhere or, or we've been caught and we've never been in court or anything like that when we go to court at a policy level I'm kind of curious, actually, Brian, about the, the sort of ultra low emission zone regulation, because it seems like that's something that actually, um, you know, the sort of characteristic approach that's sort of the, the sort of stick side of trying to have there be fewer trucks in the first place. Again, like we know, you know, New York and everywhere else that most of those trucks aren't running at full capacity. And you think about so many of like the tradesman type trucks that are moving around, particularly in Manhattan, you know, you don't need a vehicle that big for you know your plumber. You need like they need something much smaller. And I'm wondering sort of how the ultra low emission zone has worked with um, encouraging people to shift over to sort of e-cargo and, and just smaller vehicles in general. Because that obviously is part of this conversation about how you get stuff out of the bike lane is to just reduce the the demand for stuff that needs to be in the bike lane. Yeah, well, it's something that, you know, we're, we're bringing through and it's changing the like the vehicles that are moving around London. Um, the, there's a couple of different ways of, of looking at it because it's just London. It could be like uh, everybody's sending their cleaner free, uh, uh, fleets to London and everybody else is getting the kind of worse ones. And it's uh, we've got a similar situ situation with direct vision lorries is the big thing that the, the mayor's been pushing on the on the HTV safety side of it, which means all the non-direct vision ones are going to end up elsewhere. Um, but it, but it has been good. It's been good for safety with like a 
quantified the air quality benefits of, of doing this. And, and some local authorities are taking it a step further where they won't allow any emitting vehicles down certain streets. So there's, there's the, the ultra low emission zone and then there's like you are just completely restricted so the city of london are doing stuff like that and it's uh it's a real big policy driver in the uk at the moment so i'm not really answering your question too well but i just want to say if you want to talk people into into bike lanes and car restrictions the air quality arguments ringing out because it's taken a year of everybody's life in in london you know and it's uh particularly affecting like a, a serious deal so we're, we're finding it's quite useful for that and everybody gets behind it Oh, but we've got a weird situation in the, in in London at the moment where the people that don't want any cycling stuff are citing air, air quality disbenefits as a result of cycling as you're taking space away from cars or you're, you're slowing cars down and so they're emitting more as the kind of evidence against. But overwhelming is uh, there is a big report which uh, I wish I could quote more figures from on the analysis of the ultra low emission zone and it's it's pretty great stats that are coming out of it and the companies are just going yeah this is happening. And in the EU, we've got big regulations coming with cars, coming through automatic braking, intelligent speed assistance. People kind of know the gig's up and it's changing. So uh, the resistance isn't too strong, I will say. And we're so, perhaps not going fast enough. Well, 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 while we're on this topic of, of vehicle size, let me ask you, Brian, because you know we're now having a discussion in New York about what do we do with open streets? So you know, in the spring, um, there was, you know, the def definition of a, a many streets as social distancing, open space. And, and we actually, you know, and we, we had to fight it through the city council because the mayor didn't want to do it. And, you know, now there's, you know, we, we have these open streets and, you know, there's a real divergence of experience, you know, in places where there's super active neighbor committees running them and making sure the, the barriers get put out, you know, uh, and stay out um, at the right times of day. And other places, there's, there's, you know, and, and even in some of those places, there's kind of a guerrilla war going on where um, these are just crappy old anti-protest police barricades, and people can run them over and destroy them pretty easily. And some of them are half destroyed when they're first deployed. Um, and and but the council wants to mandate some kind of permanent open streets, you know, program. And a lot of people see it as like, you know, look, finally we, you know, we we did something different with our streets in New York, and you know, the sky didn't fall. Um, but there's still, the city is now starting to stress over this fire, fire department access. And so when we look at low traffic neighborhood pictures from London, you have these like giant, like wooden fortress things that are going in to create these sort of permeable for walking and biking zones, but you can't, there's no way to fit a vehicle through those things. So what, how is the fire and emergency access managed inside the, you know, the low traffic neighborhood? Yeah, well, if there's, a, if there's a need for a fire truck to go down there, we've actually kept the space there. And it'd be okay. like a cameras to enforce it to, to see who's coming through there. So there's different approaches that we use. And there's bollards with kind of lockable, well, big locks in them that basically the, the fire crews just clip the locks and just go straight through. So there's all different amendments we can make. I and mean, every single one of them has been done in consultation with the, with the fire departments and the emergency services. So we know that they're going to be supportive of it and it'll work. So if we're seeing like a three foot gap, there's there's another street where somebody can come in. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Or it wouldn't be there, or we would have thought of some way to get it through because because uh, we're not all crazy. And and some of them, those big like wooden blocks, you can knock them out of the way, a fire truck will, will get through it. But we always think about that and it's always done in consultation with them. You know, and we make reasonable efforts. And we've never ever had a report of like a, a fire truck being late to a fire as a result of any kind of intervention we make in the low traffic neighborhood. You'd think London would be burning with like some of the kickback we get, but it's just not true. They're actually supportive of them and we manage it quite well. I've said that. I, I got into like a, a kind of city councilor mode then a bit, but it is actually working quite well and we don't just block streets off for fun. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's so many things you could do. Like you could even create like opposing one way streets and the fire truck doesn't have to play by the rules they just got to get there right exactly yeah yeah well they can still get everywhere they want to go and most of them are saying it's slightly better and we've just done some really solid research on that that's just come out from from rachel aldred who's like one of our leading researchers no we know just, we know rachel because we do have to prove everything <laughs> yeah so let me let me ask brad i want to show an image that you sent over to me 
because it's on this topic of maybe if your street isn't wide enough for like a big bike lane, um, you could do a, a traffic calm neighborhood and structure the streets in a way that you can get through on a bike, but it, you're gonna have to do it very slowly in a car. So I wanna, I wanna put that on the screen and have you talk through it because it's because you applied it to, um, to the west side of Manhattan. And I wanted you to um, sort of show Talk us, talk us through that. I'm gonna um, share the screen here if I can. Sure, I mean, just while you're getting up, it's really about looking at what you do well and doing more of it. And, you know, New York has been leading the way on the kind of restaurant streets and the open streets. So we're, we're all watching out for that. Um, yeah, this isn't the one. <laughs> so, but yeah, like uh, I kind of knew this area quite well from my last trip to, to New York. Okay. I just wanted to... What, what I wanted to explain with this is what we'd be doing in the UK. So one of the things that are doing great in Manchester in particular is that we didn't have a plan. We developed the plan in a collaborative way with local stakeholders and communities and councillors and got everybody together. And then uh, Chris Borman would like to say, I, I don't touch the pen. But in this case, I did touch the pen. I, I normally give people a red pen and say, tell me everywhere in your neighbourhood where it's awful to ride a bike or walk. And they go and they get the red pens out. Then we look at that, God, that's a lot of red. We also say, actually, look, there's a lot more that isn't red. <laughs> so how do we connect these ones that aren't red up? So that's that's what I've had a little go at doing there, like uh, showing where the red pens are, where it's quite difficult. And then uh, then really we go, well, actually, if they're all acting as barriers, but inside that kind of area, this kind of one mile square area, which is normally what it kind of like just, just since we have a lot of people here who are not you know, living and breathing this stuff, tell, tell us what this is. Oh yeah, so yeah, I'm doing it. So that's what the red lines are. That's it's busy. The green dots. I'll explain next. Up, like uh, we say, well, how do you get across those those horrible bits? Can we avoid them? So they're basically like potential crossings. And I think I showed some examples of what they might look like. So we go, well, where are the crossings could go. Where could you put one? Maybe not at that junction. Maybe there. And then it's like uh, in in Greater Manchester, like just by strategically placing crossings across all the barriers, we're opening up like a, a thousand mile network in like five or six years, just by strategically placing crossings and your routes you effectively get for free because you've already decided that they're not barriers, they're kind of all right to cycle. So it's a real kind of basic network planning, which is what I've done there. But in, in inside that cell, I've kind of like shaded it like a neighborhood. Cell's always a terrible word to use, but like a, we're, we're bound by network planning rules. Well, let's there. call it a low traffic neighborhood. That sounds good. Yeah, let's call it a low traffic neighborhood. That works, doesn't it? Um, so inside that, what the theory is that cars can get in, but they can't get through. Only people walking and cycling can get through. Now, it's interesting because in the in the UK, apart from like places like Glasgow, the original grid city, we're a higgledy-piggledy mess of Roman stuff and stuff piled on there. But when you've got like a grid system, it's it's a doddle. And those little black lines that are drawn all the way going down West Yeah, those are the most intriguing to me. Yeah, they're, they're basically like... Um, the filters so you can see like i've angled them at different angles as you go down the, the grid so basically people come in one side turn around and go out come in the other side out, but they can't go through they can't go across so every car can get anywhere it wants to go within that low traffic neighborhood but none of them can get through only people walking and cycling get through so like the people in there the businesses they go well anybody that's going down there is going to drop something off for you or the residents, anybody that's going there is going to see you. It's all your local traffic. What you're not getting is like a regional trips, trip through the area actually will avoid the main junction there and just cut across here. That's all the traffic that people don't want. They're kind of the rat running traffic. So by doing that, just angle it, it turning the roads back on themselves, like minimal interventions, you can clear that whole area out and then you might necessarily need any kind of segregated infrastructure. It's just it's great to walk and New York is a great walking city. Yeah, so I was going to say, you may not need a bike lane on West 4th or West 10th. You just, you're going to yeah. drive through there. Yeah, and, just, and, and so all the cars are turning around. So you, anybody going in there has got, got a reason to go in there, got a business. So that's vastly reducing the traffic. It means the kind of red gets redder. <laughs> and like that big black line through the middle of the same well, don't let them all get away with it. Try and like uh, protect it. If you send all the traffic onto your wider roads, then you've probably got space to put in some segregated, uh, some protected bike lane. I'll use the uh, American terms or English terms are terrible. A protected bike lane. You might even be able to put some trees in there or some verges and, and clear the air quality out somewhat, but it's easier to treat lots of traffic 
on wider roads so send it all there and then protect bikes from it but basically you've got like a nice walking and cycling area just for loads of little tiny interventions and that's what we're doing that's the that's the job really particularly across greater manchester where we did this across the entire region it's an area about the same size as new york city it took 10 two-hour sessions and we had a plan that was agreed by the local people and this was their plan and then my job then becomes so much easier it's like how do i help you build your network <laughs> it's not here's the network i think you should have do that it's like let you me, came up with everybody it's know. Not a bit like a logic puzzle it's like well, let, me, let me let everybody know there is the city put out a like a sort of interim bike policy document in 2019 when you know, tons of people were being killed, you know, that summer and fall um, in on bikes in New York that included what they called bike boulevards or neighborhood greenways um, that would do something like this, where you wouldn't necessarily have a linear bike lane, but you take some steps to create like a lower traffic street. Um, and we haven't seen that, you know, unveiled COVID, you know, happened, you know, six months after that document came out. Um, and it's possible the city's working on something. They don't like to tell you what they're working on until they're really ready to announce it. But, um, you know, this isn't completely off the table um, in New York. I, I would love to see it happen in the West Village just because of, uh, you know, some of the crazy things who live there. Um, but, but the other point is, Brian, you know, at least in theory, we're going to get congestion pricing in New York in, in the next year or two. And it seems like that's kind of a one-time, you know, drop we're going to see in traffic in the Central Business District. And I mean, what's your view? Should the city have a plan for a lot of this stuff for, you know, just completely capitalizing in the moment on that kind of event? I mean, you, you, you lived through it in 2003. Yeah, that was a, it was a real big change for us. Like uh, cycle numbers went straight up. And um, what we did at the time under Mayor Ken Livingstone was reallocate lots of road space, albeit we did it to transit like a buses at the time so it was a it was a massive win we quickly got all the buses shifting and then that became the main mode that people used to get around um, we could have done a little bit more for cycling at the time uh, I will say but it was a massive opportunity because there was a big drop in the traffic in central London it's kind of going up in the last 10 years but we had a, a real kind of happy period where we could just uh, go actually you don't need the six lanes there we just need two now. <laughs> Everybody's frightened of coming in or, or it's getting to that point where, where people have a reason to go into the city and, and they need it and it's for their work and, and you're kind of filtering out the ones that are just kind of pottering around or, or I always go down that way. Um, you know, we really want people to make all those short trips by walking or cycling and, and the longer ones by public transport as much. And, and, the, and I, I will say in, in London, the public transport is, is pretty amazing, which is why the majority of residents don't even own cars. So we're we got a little bit of a of a head up there, uh, but yeah, it works really well. And and I will say yes, yes. It's I'd never say that you're capitalising it. For me, it's just you're doing sensible traffic management. And when you get to local neighbourhood areas, you should be able to walk, and you shouldn't be in peril of like uh, lots of cars. And you should be able to ride through there without dealing with like sheer volumes of people that don't even live in that area. And that, and that's been the you know the fight we've been having in in London as well to so. say where you're trying to get to. Remember when we did the Waltham Forest uh, Village Trial, which is kind of our most famous low traffic neighborhood. On day one, we had people with walkie talkies just explaining to people where you're trying to get to, you're actually gonna to have to go that way. And, and it was a bit pandemonium and it made the, the national press. And I remember one person got completely irate and we were saying, well, where are you trying to get to in the neighborhood? And actually live 15 miles away, but it always cut down that street because it's quicker than the main road. And we're going, whatever off you go and it's just that that kind of thing resonates with uh, with local people so if you do the low traffic neighborhood approach that i show they're just turning the roads everybody can get where they want to go you don't lose any parking but you get rid of all the through traffic and then it's all right to ride it's not brilliant but you've got a basic network function you tie it in with crossings you're like all right i can cope with this i can get around and, that, and that's really what we're at we're trying to give people an option to ride that's what we're trying to do in the uk because it's it's really problematic and it's the same issue in, in New York. You'll go a certain amount of distance, like four or 500 meters, half a mile, and then you come across a big old barrier and it's like, what do we do here? Like what we're doing in Manchester is tackle those big ones and the rest, you know, we'll sort out with some sensible traffic management. So uh, I do think that's on the table. Uh, it's one of my pillars of civilization. 
And uh, there's so many obvious things I think you can do with the grid pattern that it's really quite simple. And it is the sort of thing that you can give your maintenance teams, just go roll these out, 20 there, all right, bit of curb, bit of concrete, a couple of bollards, roll out across the city if people want it. So the, you can build this up quick and you, you don't take anything away apart from the annoying through rat running traffic. Everybody else gets a benefit. And as soon as you do the first couple, everybody else is crying out for it. That's, uh, you know, it makes it sound easy. We're having quite a quite a backlash to it in the UK, but we are plowing on with it. And that's 88 done in London now. Those kind of, those kind of, um diverters that Brian was showing sort of on West 4th Street. Those have been a staple of the bike program in say Portland, Oregon for a long time. Um, and- Yeah, I was just gonna say. Yeah, can you can you give us like, what, what's the status of these things in, in North America? And is there any kind of traffic cell kind of approach like as aggressive as Brian was showing that, we, that you know about? There are ideas of it. I haven't seen anybody take it as sort of neighborhood level as, as Brian's talking about, although definitely there are a bunch of cities talking about it. And I mean, the, the basic principle is you create streets where bikes can keep going straight, but cars have to turn so that it sort of diverts the turn. Um, and so it basically means that you're only going to go down the street if you actually want to go there because there's not a way to do the like the full street, straight cut through. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a whole host of Portland bike, bike lanes that are based on completely that, that concept. Um, yeah, it, it, it's got, you know, we, we've, yeah, we haven't seen it at that scale in the U.S., but I think it, it's got a bunch of options there. Um, we've done some thinking about it in terms of, you know, NACTA put out a document a couple of years ago called All Ages and Abilities, or Cycling for All Ages and Abilities, and it, and it sort of outlines some of that network solution, as well as the sort of when you need what kinds of degrees of protection on your bike lane again based on that like speed and volume equation um but i think there are there are a bunch of ways that you could you could take it further to to really allow for just that reduced traffic that makes the whole thing more comfortable what about what about in some of the more aggressive canadian examples like vancouver or toronto i mean you know canadian cities tend to put out much more and better transit service than american ones and have more transit riders per capita so less car dependent overall may be more amenable to that. And, and you know, and Brian's point is well taken that, um, you know, if we don't get our foundation of transit sorted out, you know, we're, in, we're gonna be in trouble in New York. And that's still an open question for us. And, and you know, it was, it was going downhill before COVID and now, you know, who knows what's gonna happen, but that's aside. So, uh, you know, just on this issue of, you know, low traffic neighborhoods, um, seems like it should be popular, but, you know, obviously the discourse is often dominated by noisy opponents. And, and if nobody, if, it, if folks didn't see, I'm sure many of you did, Transportation Alternatives put out a, a public opinion poll that found the same thing that Quinnipiac and other institutes were finding 10 years ago, which is that two thirds of New Yorkers want more bike lanes, lower traffic neighborhoods, safer pedestrian crossings, more city bike. Um, so, you know, we really need some leadership that was going to tap into that kind of underlying sentiment rather than you know, the noisy battlers um, in every neighborhood. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, um, I did a 10 year study on, on cycle infrastructure in London, looking at the different combinations that promoted mode shift and improved safety. And, and really the big conclusion was the, uh, there's 33 different areas. So we had uh, quite a lot of areas to model. Anyway, the ones that did best were the kind of combinations. So really you need to get those protected bike lanes in there and the lower traffic neighborhoods. It's the combination of the two of them that gets you the mode shift and reduces the collisions as well. And, and the latest state we have from our lower traffic neighborhoods is a 70%, 70% reduction in collisions where we're rolling these things out. So mm. the, the, the safety case is there. And if you've got the protective bike lanes, you've got those key commuter trips, so you've got the real numbers there. Um, so yeah, it really, really promotes the mode shift. But if you just do one or the other, it doesn't seem to quite get you there. The protective bike lanes on the road up don't seem to be enough for a full mode shift because you've got to get to it. You've got to get across it. So um, um, we like Kate, the combination idea. Kate, what are, you, you know, what are you seeing in that field? I mean, do we is there this kind of thing going on in Montreal? I mean, the mayor's been pretty aggressive in general there. It's nascent. It's 
nascent. I think that people are starting to think this way. Um, and definitely there's some interesting stuff happening. Calgary's got some interesting stuff going on. Um, Montreal's got some interesting stuff going on. Um, but again, it, it's, I think Brian's right. It, it's that sort of twofold design and then network and sort of making those two things work for you and then following it up with the big picture policy sticks that essentially give you the, the sort of the shock that makes it happen. You know, and that's the things like, you know, for example, congestion pricing, you know, the ultra low emissions and, and the biggest one being the, the sort of massive freight policy that really forces, um, forces the, reduces the number of big trucks moving around. You know, I think we're, New York's got, you know, the, the neighborhood pilot, the neighborhood uh, delivery pilot, it's a good place to start. It's, you know, clearly, um, small compared to the city, but that's, that's the, that's the type of policy level thing you, you need to start doing to deal with the fact that, you know, people are driving in parking and bike lanes because we're delivering, because we're ordering stuff. Right. Well, that's not the only reason people are parking in bike lanes, but um, I mean, what do you, Kay, what do you, you know, there is, there is a kind of discomfort um, and a shift in the political discourse in, in the United States about law enforcement in general. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, some of the traffic people, you know, sort of traffic activists have shifted more towards, well, we can do camera enforcement, um, but, you know, you can't just pull cameras out of your pocket in New York because it's, you have to go through the legislature. And, um, you know, my hope is that we don't worry so much about parking enforcement since that's unarmed, you know, officials who could work for any department, not necessarily the police. Um, but it seems like in, if we're not going to be doing parking enforcement, we're kind of toast. Um, and, and that because New York City has never admitted that this is a problem, that we have a bike network and a bus network full of cars and trucks, they've never even done any analysis of is the parking enforcement squad up to the task of, of keeping the cars out of that. Um, you know, the mayor promised tow truck teams to clear the bus lanes out two years ago, and we never saw a single event of anybody being towed out of a bus lane. Um, so it was, it was like one of the more mystifying episodes in, in the de Blasio saga, but um, like, you know, what, what do we do? You know, the city more or less effectively moves hundreds of thousands of cars around every week to do street sweeping. Why can't we, why can't we have our special lanes also clear? One of the things I will say, if you look at the Barcelona super block model and to an extent on the the example that I showed with the with the grid system in, in New York as well. Uh, they put parking, extra parking in at some of the junctions, which are no, at the intersections, which are no longer handling the, the same amount of traffic. So they've actually, uh, in some cases, got additional parking. And what I will say, and when you're talking about reducing speeds, one of the most effective ways of reducing overall traffic speed is car parking. It's just that different approach. If you're on a residential street, lots of cars park will slow down the cars there. And yeah. if, it's, if there's only cars that are delivering locally, then you can ride with them and it's all good. And you've got that kind of connections. And then, you know, you can maybe displace some of the traffic and the car parking uh, needs off some of your major roads so you can get the protection in there. So it doesn't always have to be a big hit to like a society. You could say, actually, this is a, this is a net parking gain in your area. And we remove the through traffic of the people that you don't want to be there. Like, you know, where I mean, do I sign up? You know, I mean, it, it, I mean, there's a lot of nightmarish roads like that in, in New York. If you go into Southern Brooklyn or Eastern Queens or, you know, Upper Bronx, you know, you might as well be in Nassau County or the suburbs in terms of these just horrific, you know, um, car oriented street designs. And yeah, I mean, we need a solution to that because that's where a lot of our traffic deaths happen. Um, but Kate, I wanted to get back to this issue of like, you know, what do we do? I mean, you know, we, we are starting from, you know, sort of a, a free for all situation um, in New York. And, you know, the DOT started talking, very loosely talking about bike lane cameras the other day because there's actually legislation in the city council now to let citizens take pictures of, of people parking in bike lanes and, and bus lanes and then use them as evidence to, to start um, enforcement. I mean, are you seeing that kind of stuff or is, is the situation in New York so extreme that the city council is just like, forget about the parking enforcement, let's go to the citizens. You know, what, you know, is, are we, are we an outlier? Or are we on a continuum? What's, what's the deal? Uh, New York's more on the outlier line on that front. 
Um, and I would say that, you know, I think probably the strongest move is to take some of that parking or take the parking enforcement out of PD um, as a way to really divorce the issue of parking and bike lanes from um, this question of enforcement that, you know, has some, it, it, it isn't working for us. It isn't working as a country for us very well at all, you know, and, you know, I, I'm very much understand the impetus to want citizen photographs to be, you know, something that we do as a form of enforcement. I, I personally worry about it only because I think that people are very bad at the line between um, sort of documentation and enforcement themselves. And it's very easy as we've seen, you know, across the board for people to, to get blurry and become vigilantes. Um, you know, I think that's, that's the sort of, you know, in an extreme case, that's the Ahmed Arbery story. You know, it's people who nominally said that they were there to, you know, be the watch and then turned into the enforcers. And, you know, I think we like to believe that people are good and maybe they're less good than we think. So I worry on just like a, like an actual um, structural point there, which is, you know, some of that moving the parking enforcement out of PD entirely. They don't want it. They've never wanted it. You know, it's not why people become cops. And, you know, my large understanding is that it's, basically a punishment duty for them. And so moving it into an agency that has a vested interest in caring about having traffic infrastructure or transportation infrastructure work, I mean, of which enforcement force. is a part, a small part. The people who do outside and most of the parking tickets are a separate force. They're not armed PD agents. Um, so I, I wonder if- But we where just... they get the orders from are, they're still within that agency. No, I, I, I just wonder if pattern management from the top, whether it matters, but- but no, but I get you. But you know, I mean, I do want to point out we do have a DEP anti-idling um, program that citizen enforced, and we have uh, and people can report um, taxis and, and Ubers and stuff through TLC, and that seems to work fine without you know a lot of vigilantism. Um, but um, but Brian, you you do have citizen submitted video enforcement, um, at least for moving violations in some jurisdictions in the UK. Does that work? Yeah, we're talking about the major cities. It's working um, fairly well. It's all, that, it's all down to local police force and whether they accept it. So it's not like a there's not a national standard in doing this, and and they're all really variable. Like you know, I talked a bit about pavement parking before and issues like that. Some local authorities, it's a priority, and the local leaders want it, so it's it's completely enforced. And, that, and people will be promoting that. And they, they have been promoting like citizen videos and, and stuff from cycling in London. And there's a, we've got a fantastic like a chief inspector who's really into it. And we've got a, well, one of the big game changers in, in London. And I'm not sure whether you've got them. Uh, but, so excuse me, that was like a cycling task force, getting the police actually out on bikes, and their experience. And then that, that was a massive game changer because I remember the, the officers would come to me and go, Brian, when are you going to redesign that junction? It's a, it's a nightmare. And, and having the police turn up at meetings and, and haranguing you about the poor cycling uh, provision, you know, it's a, it's a real game changer one. But it just meant that, like, a, like get it. Just like a get get a task force of the police, get them on bikes, and then they're seeing it from the cyclist perspective. And then the sheer amount of, like, criminal behaviour you have to put up with as a as a cyclist on pretty much every trip you take for a major city, they'll be seeing it. They can cover the area much easier. They get to know people. They can stop and respond to stuff. So it's a massive game changer in, in London. I'm trying to get other, other cities around the UK to do a similar thing. And those officers are worth the weight in gold. Um, so um, get them on bikes. I'm sure All that's right. required anyway. Cool. So guys, we've been at it um, about 90 minutes. And Brian, I know you're up really late and we really appreciate that. Um, I'm looking sleepy. Yeah, no, it's okay. And it may, it's understandable. But um, Kate, why don't you go first? you want to offer any you know, closing remarks here since we should wrap up? You know, what, what, are, I mean, you I think what are you seeing? What's, what, what are your hopes for New York? So many hopes. Um, I, I mean, I think that the, it kind of boils down to being honest about where we need what kind of protection, you know, and, and, and building out that toolbox. But, you know, we, we keep, you know, across the board, and it's not just New York, you know, people keep trying to do the cycling infrastructure the easy way. And I don't mean easy in terms of like, 
you know, quickly, but I mean, in terms of like cutting corners and it, it, we just have to recognize that if you want production, you need to, you need to build it in ways that, that work. And, you know, that really does involve being honest about the number of cars that are moving on the street, how quickly they're going, how much activity is. And when you've got a lot of those things happening, you've got to build out a more robust piece of infrastructure. And it does boil down to leadership and it really does boil down to that decision from the top to make, you know, all these things that we've been talking about tonight uh, a priority. And, and I think cities are, cities see it, you know, cities are imperfect and they are not, you know, they are fundamentally not monolithic. You know, there are various there are, you know, for example, phenomenal people working inside New York City DOT and all over New York City government. You know, they 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 have their, you know, their, their pluses and their minuses in their hands, you know, tied or free depending on on the day and the project. Um, but I do think that there's some great people. So what? We need to free the phenomenal people. I agree with you. Free the phenomenal people. Yes, that would be that would be my hope for for New York that we free the phenomenal people. <laughs> Um, Brian, go for it. Uh, yeah, just just in summary, I'd say it's it's not really about bike lanes. It's about building new alliances. It's walking and cycling. It's quality of life. It's air quality. It's it's health. It's being active. Just got to build those alliances till the you know the policy points are unmistakable. What one of the big things we've done in the UK in recent years is we talk about walking and cycling now, and. Uh, before, when we tried it like 20 years ago, it'd be like, yeah, we do walking and cycling and just do walking. Now the the two like uh, campaign groups and the, the policies all intertwined. And in London, it's focused on healthy streets, which is where someone will choose to walk and cycle. And then like what we're doing in Greater Manchester is a walking and cycling network. So the two go hand in hand. If you're doing a low traffic neighborhood, you close it, it's gonna be brilliant to walk. It's also gonna be brilliant to ride. Just like a think about designing street for kids, just build your alliances really. And and really like, a, I never really ever say the word cycling is our, as a UK version of bicycle. <laughs> we, we never really say, it. we just talk about the outcomes and the positives and what we're doing to make a, a better neighborhood and a better street. And that just makes it great to ride around. And if you're looking at like a, a major street where you're going to do a bike lane, well, what are you doing to make the place making better? Can people sit down? Are you going to get tree coverage? Think about the whole package that you're doing and and, and don't go in there as a cycle lobby. Go in there as a walking and cycling lobby and air quality and kids playing out. And, uh, you know, you've got to line all those ducks up as campaigners to make change. Well, I, I, I love that. The, the mayor's hearing it from everybody. So well, I, I love that. I really think we need to be talking about all of this stuff as community assets, not like, you know, somebody's going to gear up and bike commute 10 miles, but you can go with your child. You, you have open space to ride a bike with your kid. And we, we can really just message these things better um, in New York, not so much talk about networks, but talk about neighborhoods. Um, absolutely. So guys, thank you so, so much. Um, for your time, for your expertise, for the work that you do out in the world. Um, may we get you into new jobs, just working only in New York one of these days. Um, we would love that. So, and everyone else, thank you so much for your time, for, for hanging in with and, us. And um, yeah, just yeah. Share, share, let me finish and, and then you will yeah. wrap us up and close us off. Um, please come check us out at Bike New York, be behind Sharon, bike.nyc, it's the easiest website you will ever think about. Um, on Twitter, we are at Bike New York, all spelled out. Um, so thanks again. We're going to be doing more of these. Um, I don't know if Sharon's going to tease any of it, but um, it's 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 going to be really good coming up. And yes. um, you know, and we're all over the mayoral campaign, pushing candidates, talking about the issues, helping to define the issues. Um, and we're you know we haven't given up. We're still pushing for more improvements this year, right in 2021. Okay, thank you so much, John, and, and really appreciate how you have conceptualized and, and put together this program. Thank you, uh, Kate and Brian. Uh, just uh, really appreciate the generosity of your time and everyone who attended um, this program. It's your uh, support of Bike New York that um, inspires us. So I just wanted to make um, two quick announcements. Um, the first is on February the 23rd, uh, we'll have our next spoke series. And uh, we're, we're gonna be looking at linking social justice as well as biking. And I have uh, 
just uh, sent the link out to everyone in the chat. And also uh, pay attention to our uh, website because we are also uh, going to be hosting a town hall with the mayoral candidates. And um, we're so pleased that uh, we have um, all of the major uh, candidates who have agreed uh, to uh, participate in a virtual uh, town hall that Bike New York is hosting. Uh, pay attention to the website. We have a lot going on. Um, in addition to Street Action Now, which very much looks at um, the conditions of our streets and intersections and uh, really think about how we might be able to um, improve them for everyone. And working collaboratively with DLT as well as um, with uh, New York City Community Boards. Um, again, we really appreciate uh, your support of Bike New York. Um, continue to be safe, uh, continue to be healthy.